This paper is supported by uh, about 15 years of reading the literature on the invention or development and attempts to recognize the use of double entry bookkeeping. So what I'm saying is a synthesis about the accounting history literature is a synthesis of that literature. If you look uh, for the reasons why double entry was used in medieval Italy, and the Italians were the only users of double entry in medieval Europe, apart from some very small number of exceptions, you'll find in economic history literature that it was identified as being used to monitor and control just the agents, partners, and managers following the shift to sedentary forms of business. Also, where there are permanent partnerships, it was used to provide reports to owners, but only in Tuscany. What I'm gonna be talking about is another use of double entry bookkeeping, another need it served. And that was its use to avoid financial risk following the adoption of credit in commerce. And so that is gonna be where I'm gonna be placing most of the focus. Now, this paper addresses a question raised by Alistair and David Oldroyd in 2020 in the uh, second edition of Routledge um, Combined to Accounting History in their chapter on bookkeeping. And basically, if you go through the literature, you will find exactly what they said. There is no explanation for its emergence. Now, I'm going to explain why that exists, and I'll also explain what you need in order to actually answer the question. You need to know when and where it emerged. Currently, the accounting history literature says it's uh, the last decade of the 13th century by Florentine firms, um, one operating in, in Salon, which is now in France, uh, used it across the whole business, and another firm at the Champagne Fairs in 1296 was using it in its fair ledger. In order to understand why it was used, which is but would answer the question raised by Dobin Aldroyd, you need to know and understand the context. So I'm going to focus on context. First context I'm going to look at is credit. For about a thousand years, there were insufficient coins and bullion to support the expansion of trade beyond local commerce. However, in Northern Italy from the 11th century onwards, Commerce did expand. It went from local to regional to international. And it did so before 1300. Now, you can't do that if you haven't got the coins and the bullion and you rely for the rest of your trade on barter because barter is inflexible. So something else was needed. And this was recognized by Adolf Schaub, who is a German economic hist historian, um, who in 1906 wrote a 800-page book published it in German, where he analyzed a commerce of the Mediterranean up to 1300, which was the end of the Crusades. And he, he identified this problem about the shortage of cash and, and he suggested that expansive trading was impossible, there must have been a solution. And what he identified was credit as a solution. But in order to make credit function in this way, you needed bookkeeping. So he tied the, the, the beginnings of bookkeeping to the use of credit in commerce. And what he was talking about was this. This is the earliest um, example of a ledger that has come down to us. It was mentioned by Francesco. It's one of four pages that has survived from 1211 of a Florentine bank. And he was focusing on this when he made that statement about the bookkeeping. Looking at it, he says it shows us the system in its fullest development. In other words, it was a system that could be used in a commercial environment where credit was widespread. And he points out the things that can be seen in the entries that indicate that it was really quite a sophisticated system that had been developed in order for this to work. In 1930, Mario Chiadano, um, had another look at this set of four pages. And if you look what he's saying in the first paragraph, he's recognizing this to be double entry. It's got the reference from one account to the other, double entries, et cetera, et cetera. And he says, it's the first germs of double entry records that will develop and improve. And if you compare this to, for example, the Ferolfi records in Salon that, that we have, the Ferolfi ledger, 
you can see how it became more sophisticated, but it was still embracing the same sort of things. The Florentine bank ledger has been dismissed as not being double-ended by every accounting historian who's looked at it, including myself. I, I just said it was, in du it was dual entry, that is, as a debit and a credit, end of story. And I, I stopped at that point because the accounting history literature is so damning of this document. I just assumed that it was correct. I believed it was true and moved on. But when you look closer at it, as I'm going to do now, you'll see it is actually in double entry. This is a page layout. It's got 13 accounts on it. The vertical line in the middle just is for to avoid waste of paper, or waste of parchment. At the top is the heading, which tells you where the accounts relate to. And what I'm going to focus on is the heading and part of the first account. The heading starts off with invocation to God, which was standard across society at that time. You'll see it in school books written by the, 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 the students or the pupils. And it says that these accounts relate to the San, to San Broccolo. San Broccoli Fair was a regional fair held in Bologna in the first week of May every year. And it still is held in May every year. The second line tells you the year that these accounts relate to, and it's 1211. And this is a transcription of what's written on that page. You'll note, if you look at the second bottom line in the middle, some of the abbreviations that are used in it. There's a lot of abbreviations, so it makes it quite difficult at times to work out what it's actually saying. But the TT, for example, means testamento, witnessed. The O with the line above it means there's some letters missing around here, and that word is actually compagno. Translated, it reads like this, and I've put in the explicit or implicit terms that we would recognize. It begins with the name of the account holder. Because surnames, family names were not normal at that time, you have to put extra uh, description in in order to identify the people. So he's a tanner from Santa Trinita, which was in Florence. He's debited, diedari, which is the term used in Italian for debit today, um, 26 libra, and it's a loan lasting for two weeks for cash, so the cash account would be credited, which we gave him in Bologna for the broccoli, some broccoli fair. Then there's a, a section of the entry that talks about the penalty for late payment. Then an, a witness is named who's Angelino, who's from Bologna, and he's a tanner, so he's firmly identified. And then the witnesses are firmly identified. This is followed by the word item, which even then was a standard formulaic term. It just meant the, sec the next entry in this account. And that makes the name of the uh, entry, the person involved in the entry, implicitly Orlandino. Diaviri, which is, is how uh, credit is described in Italian now, but then it was just the verb that was used because it described what happened. 43 soldi, there were 20 soldi in a libra, so that's basically a part repayment. By me, Kelly, son of Galetti, so you knew who had made this payment. We post them for, on the advice of, on the instructions of, Michele, uh, to the debit of the account of the stutterer Mainetti. So what's happened is Michele has arrived with a promissory note from the stutterer Mainetti and has asked for the funds to be credited to Orlandino rather than to be paid to Michele himself. That is very sophisticated bookkeeping. That's not your just simple debits and credits. The next context, statutes. The, in 1884, Alessandro Lattes wrote a 400-page book um, based on a study he conducted of all the extant statutes from northern Italy from about the 13th to 17th century. It includes one from 1202 from Milan, which says that the, um, the creditor has the right to, to, to instruct his debtor to pay whoever he chooses. And it's full of statutes relating to commerce that are either city statutes, town statutes, or guild statutes. And these, in the way that he, has, he puts it all together and the descriptions he provides, these provide a foundation for the content of the commercial writing that is represented by those fragments. Santini, who actually transcribed those fragments in 1887, took that on board and his opinion it was the laws that determined what was, went into the account book. And it's clear, he says, that the jurists, the legal experts in 1211, considered it valid to write 
maintain commercial um, records in Italian. But bear in mind that the language of the law was Latin, of government was Latin, of the church was Latin, but that was not the language of the people. So if they let these records have been kept in Latin, and a lot of the people who would have wanted to know what was in them would have not have been able to read them. By putting them in, in Italian, everyone who could read could read them. And that's why they did it. Now that's, that's known as pragmatic literacy. And I'll come back to that in a minute. On the basis of what he'd, he'd uh, considered and from what he'd seen in the records, he said it, it, was, it was natural to believe that these had reached a point of maturity effectively, that they couldn't possibly have been invented in 1211. And that this method using the, the spoken language must date back several years into the 12th century. So he's positioning the invention of double entry back in the, in the 12th century. Now, in terms of pragmatic literacy, here's an example from Sweden, same sort of thing, movement towards the use of the spoken language in, in legal documents. It's effect, effectively the same point. And that statement by Santini was ignored by accounting historians, as were the views of Schaub and Cardano. Um, accounting historians completely ignored them. Why were these ignored? For after all, they were basically saying, here's double entry, here's why it was used, here's what it contained, and the reasons for it. Accounting historians ignored all that. Why? Because of the definitions they were using. This is how bookkeeping was defined to me at 15 years of old, when I attended a one-year course at school, which was effectively bookkeeping 101. I never did any accounting. I never saw a profit loss account or a balance sheet. It was never mentioned. We just did bookkeeping. It's also the definition in Collins Dictionary. The double-entry bookkeeping, this definition is based on what Pat Choley wrote, and it's what everyone would agree is double-entry bookkeeping, I'm sure. And a double entry bookkeeping system, one in which all transactions are entered in double entry, all very straightforward at this point. And then accounting, it's a process of taking information from bookkeeping system and using it to prepare financial reports. Accounting is not the same as bookkeeping, but accounting history, when looking at double entry begins with the accounting by looking for either financial statements, capital accounts, movements in the equity within capital accounts, or the possibility of creating those financial statements from the bookkeeping system. It begins there. If you can't see that, it goes no further. You'll see several examples in the literature of people who've written about the account books they can see, and because they can't see this evidence of financial reports or the possibility of creating them, they've dismissed it as not being a double entry. And they work through that to the double entry bookkeeping system back into double entry and they ignore bookkeeping. And because they ignore bookkeeping, they don't know what books were used. So it's assumed in the accounting history literature, more, more or less, that they used a day book, a journal, and a ledger. And as you heard from Francesco's talk, that's not what they were doing in Florence. In Florence, they had, um, they had, they had accounts that were held in the memorandum. They had accounts that were held in the merchandise book, not in the ledger. So it's a very different system. And how the accounting history should identify double entry is basically based on what double entry is. It's a bookkeeping system. So you start with bookkeeping, then look at whether it's double entry, and then look at whether there's a double entry bookkeeping system. And you don't need to look at accounting. It's separate. So if you want to know if double entry has been used, you should approach it using those three statements there. Now, Raymond de Rover, who, was, who was, came on, onto the scene in the 1930s, um, and spent a lot of time looking at Italian double entry in, in Tuscany. Uh, he, he, in 1956, he wrote about how accounting history had developed. And he said that under the leadership of Fabio Besta, who effectively founded the school, or the, the theory, the, sorry, the, the, the discipline of accounting history, um, they decided to focus on form and procedure. So it's what's in the account and what's, it, what's done with it in, in terms of the accounting or the bookkeeping. And he compared that to what was happening in, in the mid 20th century, where the younger generation was starting to look at what is used for. And by implication, he was saying that Besta and his colleagues in the first three decades of the 20th century didn't look at that. They didn't look at what it was used for. They just looked at what it was. And he was referring by the younger generation to people like Federico Mellis, 
in uh, Tuscany, Florence and the surrounding area, and to Frederick C. Lane in Venice. They were looking much more closely at what the information was used to do. And if you do that, you get an understanding of why it was used, but they, the accounting historians, the, the traditional ones were not doing it. And in the de Gruber's opinion, they were the right, they were doing the right thing, constraint informed procedure. So he defines double entry in the same uh, chapter um, as duality and the existence of an integrated system of accounts, both real and nominal. That's accounts that go in the balance sheet and accounts that go in the income statement. And by doing that, he was eliminating any ledger that only contained personal accounts from being described as being double entry. And he says that by having this integrated system of accounts, your books are balanced in the end, you'd be able to record changes in the equity and you'd be able to, in the equity of the owners. And it allows the profit and loss to be defined. So he's really focusing on the, on the ability of the system to produce an absolutely comprehensive set of financial statements. And that's conflating the bookkeeping with the accounting. And if they couldn't see those things, they just said it's not double entry. So as a result, if you read this literature, which goes back 100 years, bookkeeping is 100% the same as accounting. Why was that the case? Well, two years later, Drover told us why it was the case. He said, things are so different now. We have not a clue why they are doing what they did. We can't explain what they did. Now, bear in mind, they, they had not been looking, the county historians had not been looking at how the records were used for management or control. They were just looking at what they looked like. So it's not surprising they couldn't understand why they were doing things. And he said, we, we do things so differently now, we can't possibly put ourselves in their place. And that's why the approach taken by the accounting historians in the literature conflates the bookkeeping and accounting because it allows them to be Whiggish and focus on the financial statements. Whiggish history views history as inevitable progress and improvement. It looks back from the present to see signs of it in the past. So we know what a profit and loss account looks like. So we look for it in the past. We see it. We think, yeah, that's, that's, that's what we'd expect. We, look, we know what a balance sheet is. Look back. So yeah, that's what we'd expect. And it's often adopted a Whiggish approach in response to lack of knowledge and understanding of context. And the accounting historians of the first 30 years of the 20th century were not really interested in context. They were interested in form and procedure. And as a result, the literature is, of that period is treated as seminal. But it was done Whiggishly. That is, it was done from the present looking at the past rather than looking at the past and trying to understand it in its context. It's recognized as perfect, as, as a fact. And anyone who challenges it is rebutted and ridiculed. Just this year, um, I've had a conference paper reviewer tell me, it's astonishing that I would consider challenging this literature. Another one wrote, it's outrageous what I was doing, and basically I should be ashamed of it. And I was told, if it, it is all done, we know everything already. There's no point in doing any more work in this area. Well, I'm sorry, that's not what historians do. Historians should recognize that techniques change, the, re, the, the methods used in, in historical work develop and improve over time, technologies improve, and we learn, we, we gather more evidence. And when we are in that position that we are changing our knowledge and understanding of how to do history and of the periods we're looking at, we're duty bound to go back and revisit the history that we we think we've finished. And what I would say is that if we did that with this literature, we would rewrite this history totally. So the literature is confusing. The, the definitions are ambiguous and vague, and sometimes it's difficult to tell what people are talking about. Sometimes in the literature, people will say something that uh, is intended in one way and is read in another. That's not surprising. Hoskin and McVie were talking about reporting. My reading of the papers are talking about financial reporting using a double entry bookkeeping system. And they could see that in the 13th and 14th century in Tuscany. And they couldn't see it in any significant form until the 19th century when the accounting profession developed. Uh, financial reporting became widespread and the double entry system gained widespread adoption. That's basically what that paper was saying. And that was read by Dobrin Oldroyd as saying single entry accounting seems to remain the norm in Britain. Now, unfortunately, this cannot be true. 
these are the editions of textbooks published in Britain uh, since 1501 up to the end of the 18th century. 422 editions. If you look at those published between 1601 and 1800, over the 200 year period, there were 413. The average edition for books published in London in 1575 was 620. Let's assume that the same volume of, of production was in place after that, which is an understatement, and take 413 editions of books times 620, you get 256,000 textbooks on double entry bookkeeping published in Britain between 1601 and 1800. It's published in a country that doesn't use double entry. I'm taking another approach, copies per title. This is data for the number of copies of each title published. In the final decade of the 17th century, of, of 17th century, you've got 1,200 copies minimum for a title that was published. I'm taking that minimum, and the 365 editions published between 1701 and 1800, you get 438,000 copies of textbooks on double entry published in Britain. Now, that's maybe an overstatement because copies doesn't equal um, editions. Some uh, titles were uh, published in multiple editions, but not many. So let's say, for example, for instance, that, that we accept the average was two editions per title and change that, you still get over 200,000 copies published in the 18th century. Taking it a different way, according to Jeanine, who did the study this data comes from on the left, there are 170 single edition titles plus 15 multiple editions. That gives you 190 titles. You multiply it out, you get 228,000 textbooks published in that period. Now, if you separate accounting from bookkeeping, the clarity comes, the double entry system is in place in the Florentine Bank Ledger. The accounting historians could not see it. They ignored the views of these three people. Why did they ignore them? Because they were looking for financial statements and capital accounts showing change in equity. They were approaching it this way, and they added on this requirement for properly adjusted financial statements, if they found any, uh, when they should have been doing it this way. And if they'd done it this way and they were aware of the context, they'd have said, well, if we wanted to ensure that the context is actually being addressed by the double entry system, we would expect to see that. And that, the, the signpost to the evidence is precisely what you get in the accounts that I've shown you from 1211. So going back to Dobby and Old Roy's statement, we know that double entry was in use in 1211 in Bologna. We know that from the contextual point of view that they had credit and they had uh, the statutes. And that gives us the ability to prepare a causal diagram based on all that information to look at the invention of double entry. The catalyst was a shortage of cash and that developed a business risk of lost trade because you couldn't sell to people that couldn't settle their, their business with you. So they started using credit, that created debt. Debt, there was a risk, business risk of default. So to counter that, you kept a record. That's where bookkeeping begin, began. But the records could be disputed, so you had to ensure that your record cont contains the information, the detail needed, and the evidence to support it when you wrote it up. And that is why the records look like that in 1211. That's to deal with the, the, the fact that you haven't got uh, cash, separation cash, you're using credit, and the legal system. So in the 13th, early 17th century, double entry was used to avoid financial risk because of this reliance on credit in order for business to operate. And that is why this diagram uh, can be constructed to demonstrate the reason, the explanation that Dobie and Oldroyd couldn't find and that you won't find in the accounting history literature.